Welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and cockles. I'm Ross Boland, joined today as always by my buddy Mr. Barrett Dudley to bring you the best TV shows and movies weekly in an easily digestible podcast packed with laughs. Barrett, how are you doing today, sir? Um, I'm doing both good and bad. Uh, do you want to know? Do you want to hear why? Yes, give me the... Give me the good first, though. Okay, the good first is on the way over here. I've got this new playlist on Spotify that I found that is all, it's it's called like karaoke and sing-along classics, basically. And so okay. on the way over here, I heard uh, Maroon 5 featuring Wiz Khalifa, Payphone. I heard <laughs> uh, Luis Fonsi and Justin Bieber, uh, Despacito. And I heard Jason Derulo in my head. Three back to back to back straight fire bangers, and um, it just it really that put me in a in a in a really nice headspace. That made me wonder how many of those were produced by Benny whatever from uh, Dave. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so Benny Benny Blanco. Yeah, so I actually went up and looked his like. Uh, Dude, his whole... I had no idea that's what he looked like, man. That was so had no idea a, that's what he looked like. What a trip. <laughs> Fucking hilarious guy, obviously. Yes. And uh crushed his role on the show. But really I had did. no idea he was behind as many hits as he was. Okay, so give us the bad, Barry. Uh the bad. The bad. Um I, I made a sandwich for lunch before I came here. And it's like the bread is good, but I like I like my bread toasted. And when this bread toasts, it gets kind of like kind of like rough and tumble. And it just kind of like it wreaked havoc on my mouth, man. You know when you're eating a sandwich and it's it's like it like it's it's poking you in the roof of the mouth and it's it's doing all that type of stuff and it's like almost like a uncom- toasted sandwich, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, the sandwich, sandwich is good, but it's 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 kind of painful to eat. And so, and then I didn't have any gum. I, I couldn't find any gum on the way over here, and that's what I really felt like I needed to like to to turn my to turn my frown upside down and. Um, <laughs> Instead, I had to settle for the three back to back to back bangers instead on the uh, <laughs> on the speech. What a day you've had so far! Yeah, man, it's been it's been something. This is uh, look. That's the most exciting story I've told in weeks. So, <laughs> well, let's get into some other people's stories then. Uh, we just finished Dave's season one. I finished actually, literally. We're yeah, gonna be but I I, I want to do today. I want to do tid. I'm going to cut you off right there. I, I think we should do tidbits first. We're going to. We're okay, going to. okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I finished Dave season one literally right before we started recording. Barrett finished Outer Banks season one. Uh, so we're going to have closing thoughts on season one of Outer Banks as well. I have a McConaughey point to reiterate for the hundredth time after that. Uh, and who knows where the wind will take us. But today's episode of OCC is brought to you by Lisa, makers of the greatest mattresses in the fucking world. I routinely argue your mattress is up there with your TV in terms of important purchases you make for your home. Just as important as your living room television, your, your your bed that you sleep on every single night. It's important. Is it shitty? Do you even remember where it came from? When's the last time you got a new one? Lisa is the answer. Lisa knows how important rest is to a better life. Lisa is the foundation of a healthier, happier you. And to Lisa, a bed is more than just a place to sleep. It's a place for relaxation and rest. I sleep on the Lisa Legend every night. I had the Lisa Hybrid, their hybrid mattress for a few years before that. Most comfortable bed I've ever laid eyes or body on, as I said a hundred times on this show. I love both of them. They're phenomenal. I sleep on their pillows. They're phenomenal. I've got their blanket. It's phenomenal. Bless you, Barrett. Gazoon tight. Uh, and and they're the best. They donate one mattress for every 10 they sell through organizations that work in causes like foster care prevention. To date, they've donated more than 33,000 mattresses through more than 1,000 nonprofits. Lisa mattresses are made in the USA. In-home delivery and setup is available. Financing is also available. Don't miss out, Clam Fam. Live healthier. Live happier by resting deeper. Order today and get 15% off any mattress for a limited time at lisa.com slash dragon. And use the promo code dragon. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash dragon. Dragon. Promo code dragon. Lisa. Liza. (laughs) Billy Costa. All right, now, Barrett. Yes. Tidbits and such with Barrett. It's time for Tidbits and such with Barrett to start the show because what better way, Barrett? Take I, well, and I want, I think Tidbits make sense up front because maybe you haven't seen the whole season of Dave and you don't want it to be any spoilers or you're not all the way caught up with with uh, uh, Outer Banks, hashtag OBX, um, hashtag Mudgate, and you don't, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to listen to that part. Well, now you're just going to get all the news and enter- entertainment. Info, infotainment, because a lot of this is just straight up, you know, in, in information and knowledge and cool stuff like that. So it just makes Absolutely. sense. It makes sense early while you're while you're here. And I've, I'm going to give you some tidbit. I gave you a great story about a sandwich that um, 
was a, a little too toasty, and now I'm going to give you uh, tidbits and such. Um, here's my first tidbit. I'm going to start out with this. Um, obviously, the fight for equality has not ended just because uh, some of the protests have calmed down. It is still on us to learn and listen and do all those things that we were talking about a few weeks ago. It's important to keep it top mm -hmm. of mind if we want to see any type of real change. So um, one way that I've been trying to do that is by uh, including more black stories in my uh, in my TV watching. So I've got a couple of recommendations here. There's a documentary on Netflix by Ava DuVernay, super talented uh, black female director called 13th. And if you have heard like, you know, the words prison industrial complex, but you don't really know what that means. The, the, I mean, like, this will tell you everything you need to know. This is the type, this is the type of documentary that leaves you disgusted and infuriated and floored and um, mad that, that like, this is not required viewing when you're like a sophomore in high school. You know what I mean? Because this is, this is, this is the shit that they, breeze right past and they kind of glaze over and they don't really tell you about but like our political system has just like insidiously used policy to keep up like a racial hierarchy and um it's yeah. so this so, gets into all the stuff like privately owned prisons right? privately owned prisons and, so that that's and, the phrase that i was more familiar with than the industrial whatever so it's it's and i still haven't watched this so i'm going to speak to it from the other side of it it's the it's single-handedly first of all you've seen a million lists and recommendations over the past couple of weeks and we have received dozens and dozens of messages and dms from people actually recommending that we watch more black stories, include more black stories in our in our podcast, obviously as well. And this is the one that I see far and away more than any other recommendation. Is like if you haven't watched Thirteenth, you have to watch it. So really, no excuse. I just haven't watched it yet, and yeah, and it's and I something mean, that it, I need to do look, by the end of the week. Part of this is that it's it's not easy. It's this is not like this is you're going to sit down for an hour and forty five minutes and you're going to have your head your your head exploded um, by what you learn here. It's not like it's not fun. You know what I mean? And it's honestly worse because, dude, I, I know enough about the situation with our privately owned prisons and the way that policy has been drawn up since the beginning of time in America to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, I mean, really at this point, just like the more underprivileged uh, and poorer class classes in our country are held down that way. Yeah. Um, through this sort of institutionalized prison situation. I mean, and of course, it, there's a there's a racist side to it as well that is that, that impacts black people in America far more than anyone else. Um, but a, as a whole, I know enough about that situation that I know how f daunting this documentary is. It's like it's yeah, that's a that's part of the reason I haven't watched, man. And that's the sad thing is like there's still that element to all this where. There's certain aspects of it where I'm like, fuck, I don't want to look. Yeah. And it, and it's, I mean, it, it starts with Nixon, but uh, like it goes right on through to Clinton, who actually enacted some of the most harmful uh, crime bills that we've known to date, like the three strikes rule and, uh, and, and a couple others that uh, are just, it's wild, man. It's really, really... It's informative, and I, I I I cannot highly recommend like that you just like go sit down for an hour and forty minutes and watch this documentary so that you know a little you can't bit more. More highly recommend. But yeah, yeah. Um, so it doesn't all have to be nonfiction though. As well, there are great TV shows. Uh, one that I've started watching now is also on Netflix. It's called Dear White People, and it is. Basically, it, it, it's a story that is focused on an Ivy League college, and it focuses on the student lives of the black kids at, at this school and how they how they perceive this like majority white world that they're living in here at this kind of neoliberal institution that fancies itself very progressive, but still falls into many of the pitfalls that that all of us myself included have been guilty of over the last you know uh, f for us personally 15 20 years but really for the last 50 and so it's just it's 
man, it's like, like I'm, this is one of the way, one of the ways where, that I'm just like disappointed in myself for, for not getting here earlier, you know, because it's, we, you and I talk about how, like, one of the things that we judge TV shows on and that we get from TV and movies is, uh, is, uh, is relationship to characters, right? You find, you find something relatable. That's how you kind of like, that's how you engage. And so we oh, watch, yeah. a, we watch a movie like Parasite and we're able to kind of like, see things in a new light or a new perspective or kind of take something from that. Sure. It's exactly the same with a show like Dear White People or Insecure on HBO. I mean, you just get a real life picture. This is this is a way that you uh, get information. You you listen and hear a story and you see people that you like on TV and you understand what, what they're going through b b from the TV show, right? Like that's just... That's one of the ways that we distill information. And so w putting Honestly, on these shows that maybe you like, maybe you wouldn't have just because like that. It, and that's okay. You see insecure and it's like, it's all black people. It's that's, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find anything for me in that. And then you watch it and you do, and you get a lot, you get a lot more from it because it's giving you insight into, into something that you're not totally familiar with. And so which to that to that point from the other side, it's hysterical because in the saddest way possible. Because Hollywood and television and movies for our entire lives and since again, they're since they became a thing have been so white. Uh and it's mostly white stories. And just imagine <laughs> from yeah. the other side being a person of color growing up in America. You got like, you know, I sure you got some options, three or four shows for y'all. No, the whole fuck, every other channel, it's, we had thousands of options. Every show I could relate to, every character was white. I mean, it's like, honestly, I learned more through the very, very slow progression back toward this, the way it should be, where we're getting more sides of every story from mm -hmm. people of all colors. I've learned more from television and movies about racial issues in America by far than I have from school. Uh, cause like you said, we didn't really get the, re I mean, they, look, it's not a narrative. I just straight up was not correctly taught about race in America in school. Right. And I went to really good schools. So, yes. I mean, that's, that's not like a, an argument. It's just a, it's a fact. Like I didn't know enough. I still don't know enough. And the, most of the shit I've learned has been through TV and movies and, and, even with the few and far between, you know, black stories, we'll call them, that I've in, that I've watched and gotten to engage with, even not making it a priority. And I will say this: it's important that you understand what when we say black stories. It doesn't mean a ch it's like a TV show with like a black character in it. Like you need to be finding shows and movies that are written and directed by black people. They they can't just have a black character or a black actor. Sure. Because it could still be a completely white angle behind that, for all you know, or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Like Outer Banks has two black kids on it, but that is not a <laughs> that doesn't make it a black story. You know what I mean? Like, no, you gotta you gotta engage with the, what Barrett is giving great examples of, which are shows that are written by, produced by, directed by, starring black people. Yeah, and I mean, just think about think about how provocative and informative and amazing Watchmen was last year, right? Yeah, like. It, he, he, God, right on the cusp of all this shit. I know man. exactly. It was just incredibly prescient um, f for that show to to kind of precede this. But that's one of the things you know. We, I, I, that's one of the things I keep telling myself. And then you watch like this first season of Dear White People, 2017. They're talking about all the same shit, man. I like you, you in this Ava DuVernay doc, uh, the the thirteenth. She kind of intersperses like the very the various eras with um with rap songs like socially conscious rap songs and puts the lyrics up on the screen and you hear like Nas and Public Enemy and you're like you listen to Tupac changes like <laughs> that one blows my they've mind they've been so. saying this for so long it's that's what's so embarrassing is that like it has taken this quarantine and like this most recent wave of awful police brutality for us to be like oh man there yeah there is something wrong and we should do something about it. So it just, yeah. you know, that's on that's that's on us. And and I, I mean, it sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah, the pers the the the, uh, the lack of perspective. Um, I mean, really, from all sides in this country, is is pretty glaring. And it's never it was never more apparent than it has been made this past several months with all the circumstances. And it's like, I I, I try to look at everything in my life this way, but 
you know, when, when you go through really bad shit, there, it's like a blessing in disguise. You got to find the, the wrinkles, find the lessons, find the good stuff that comes from it. And I, I don't think there's ever been a more obvious one than, than everybody, you know, get, having more a bridge to each other. Like, we finally had this moment with no sports, with no movies, with no new TV, with like, right. where there's an opportunity to actually see something yep. that you didn't want to see or you didn't have the proper perspective on or whatever. There were too many distractions in your life. There's it was too easy for exactly, you. Exactly. It was too easy for you to look away. And then now it's like it's all ripped wide open and... And that's the blessing is that at least we have the opportunity to to change and yeah. to to go back to that. Tupac's Changes is the song that it literally gives me chills now when I go listen to it. Because, man, I remember – I've not told this story, I don't think. But I remember I was in middle school at St. Francis Episcopal Day School in Houston, Texas, which was a 99.9% .9 white school. And it was probably – whatever the year changes dropped. Yeah, I want to say it was at, like 97 or 98. At one of our dance, so I'm fucking ten years old or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe, maybe let's let's say let's assume it was a couple few years later because I don't think yeah, we had no, dances. Yeah, no. I when think I was we 10. were. I think we were around. We were definitely old enough to be listening to hip hop at that point because Changes was my favorite song, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I wasn't. I wasn't really listening to a ton of rap yet. I was not there, and like, and, and eventually it was funny. Like one of my buddies older brothers who was considered like the bad kid because he listened to rap. <laughs> When we went to his house, he played some for me. And that, anyway, the point is this. I remember hearing they played changes at one of our dances, okay? And it was the most awkward, like, in terms of feeling the energy of racial tension and weirdness, it was the first time in my life that I ever felt it because I remember listening to the lyrics and being like, and hear all these kids, these little white kids rapping along to this song and all these white teachers watching and the white DJ vibing out behind the thing and like, you know, Clyde Drexler's daughter is in the corner and she's loving it too or whatever. But like <laughs> the song was about something that none of these people had any understanding of. Yes, right. And yet exactly. you're jamming yeah. to it. And then, and I sort of remember, because it was weird. It was like the DJ, I think, got in trouble for playing the song. Like they were like, wow. that was too much. These kids are 14 or some shit. Which in fairness, like, it was they were playing a lot of rap songs that I was like, man, it like you were were y'all trying to get us to fuck, but um, the point it, with changes in particular, it was like, it was, it was just this weird moment that stuck with me forever. And then when I played that song for the first time a, few, a couple months ago, whenever this was unfolding, and listened to the lyrics again, and it struck me that literally what he was saying then was that he's seen no changes, and that it's been twenty fucking years since then or whatever. And it's every single bar still resonates. Obviously, yeah, we 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 probably should have been paying more attention. But yeah. Anyway, um, yes, that's great. Yeah. I'm, I need I need to get on thirteenth. Definitely. Um, okay, so we can move on to some other tidbits here. All right, I've got two about cast new casting moves um, out there in Hollyweird. Jamie Foxx confirmed to play Mike Tyson in a new biopic slash biopic. Dude, I cannot wait. Uh, Are you to stoked see for this, that? Though. I am stoked for this. Yeah, Jamie uh, Fox has the uncanny ability to he does he does that thing where he can transform into yes, someone. He yes, he absolutely can. And and I and he's got this kind of look to him where I'm like I can see them turning him. The, the, I, I know oh, they're gonna yes. be able to turn him into like look exactly like Iron Mike. It's gonna be crazy. yeah it, yeah it's gonna be pretty crazy. Um, Michael Keaton could come back as an old Batman in a new DC superhero movie i believe it's the flash movie uh michael keaton may return as batman as old batman huge for michael keaton uh yeah. i care not for the seven thousand variations of superhero movies being made and i will never watch whatever that is probably but i love michael keaton his batman was dope dude it was not a bad batman it was the batman to me until uh we got christian bale and yeah, good for him. Get another yeah. check, dude. Um, uh, speaking of Batman, shouts to Joel Schumacher, who recently passed, but he was uh, responsible for a Batman Forever, which featured the Neon Gang, which th then got a recurring uh, gig on Westworld this past season, as we've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot he did those Batmans, dude. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, bro. Rest in peace to Joel Schumacher. He was a. I didn't realize how many how many legendary things he had done. 
Okay, this is a little, this is going to be both a mea culpa here and a, and a bit of a vent. Um, Yellowstone has returned for its third season on the Paramount Network and is doing yes. absolute numbies. Like it is posting up like triple digits on the scoreboard, Wilt Chamberlain style, uh, just dunking on people, doing like five million on the fucking Paramount Network. So I do apologize that we never got to Yellowstone. Here's the vent part. Make this show available somewhere, you dumb idiots. Yeah, like, look. This, this is the only, this is, dude, they did the trailer. I, I, I was watching TV, some channel on, on through my YouTube TV, and like they were doing the trailer for Yellowstone. A little thing popped up and it was like, make sure to set your DVR. I shouldn't have to do that. It's 2020. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Why don't you have a deal with one of the eight different streaming net platforms that I pay for every month? It makes no sense to not. What is that called when they do that? When they get just the, when they make a deal to put it play it somewhere else too? Not subsidize. Uh, uh, not. Why is the word put me on the spot? I, I can't. I know now. I fucked I you up too. Because like, whenever you give somebody the 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 wrong word, <laughs> then that screws them from the start. They can never think. Syndicate. But no. You're talking about syndicate. syndicate. Great job, syndication. Um, okay, so look, I I have the stupid Paramount app on my Apple TV. And I've watched 10 minutes of this first episode of season one. And I've been told one billion times, Ross, you're going to love Yellowstone by a billion people. And look, I get it. The problem is Yellowstone is a horse show. It's nonstop damn horses. And my dog behind me, Bruce, he's not a fan of horses. He goes belligerent. I can't. It doesn't play. Like, I cannot. It doesn't. I would have to lock him in another room. And I, I was... When season one got hot, I just fell too far behind. And I saw the the crazy numbers they're doing, Barrett. The craziest number is the jump from season two viewership to season three. Yes. Like, yes. Like they pulled in like an additional 2.6 million people or some crazy, 3 million people, whatever it was. Millions of new viewers from two to three, which means that the reputation of the show mm -hmm. and the quality of it are are both ringing true. And it makes me even more angry that it's not available in a more wide or in some type of syndicated form on Hulu or on somewhere, dude. Put it fucking season one and two. Put them somewhere. Even if it's the thing where we get a season late on somewhere else, fine. But just give us give people the opportunity to watch right, the show. Right, because there's no – because I'm looking it up now. I can either purchase Yellowstone season one and two on Vudu. Uh, Nobody's for doing that. $15. And the final five episodes of season one, oh, real helpful. Yeah, that's that. It, we're on season three, but what I need is the final, the back half of season one. That's all I need. Thanks, Paramount. Those are available if you have a valid Fubo TV subscription. Like, come on, man, get the fuck out of here with this. Voodoo, Fobo, who are these people? Like, dude, uh, and exactly, th this show is doing fantastic. Imagine what it could be doing if it was being given that second life, if it was available on Hulu or Netflix or where or Prime or wherever. Like, get the, get imagine your being, together, dude. Imagine being Kevin Costner. Imagine being one of the stars of this show, and you're just like, oh fuck me. Yeah, we've got one of the yeah. best shows on TV, and we're limited to the damn Paramount app. Yeah. Um. Okay. Here's a here's another one. I don't know if you ever heard about this show that was in development with HBO. It was going to star Robert Downey Jr. And it was a reboot of an older TV show called Perry Mason. I va vaguely remember hearing about this. Yeah. Well, this show has premiered. It just did on Sunday on HBO. <laughs> um, it's wildly expensive. It costs like $75 million for the first season. What? And it does not star Robert Downey Jr. He was he was replaced due to like some I believe scheduling constraints. It now stars Matthew Reese of uh, the Americans fame, and oh, this okay. is like this was a show that I felt was kind of highly anticipated. Uh, obviously, it's super expensive, and then it kind of debuted to very little fanfare, and I'm just surprised that we weren't getting more hype leading up to this when we were watching outsider and curb and uh and and various other stuff on on hbo earlier i never got a single teaser to this i don't think i don't i don't feel like we did so so i'm not sure um look it's a big expensive franchise from hbo so i'm i'm definitely going to check it out and i think it's it's probably something that we need to talk about on the pod 
um, maybe not episode by episode, but but certainly give some give some uh, some time to. I just didn't I didn't realize it was uh, it was out basically until somebody DM'd me about it. HBO has a history of sort of failing to properly market shows outside of their own um, ecosystem. And this one, because they didn't give it any shine, maybe they were still figuring out what exactly was what and they didn't want to promote it yet during those big shows that you just mentioned, because we didn't see a single commercial or anything. It's like, yeah, what the hell? I have, I have no real even recollection of what this was supposed to be about. And it's just out now. It just came out on yeah. Sunday. Like yes. I didn't see. Yes. Here's the thing. Like I didn't see like a tweet or an Instagram or like you know what I mean. Like that's where they no. Really I know. How did this? How did this completely? How did this co- completely miss us? I mean, maybe it's also maybe it's just the time. Like I don't know that what your too, Twitter timeline still, looks like, but I, I got nothing but I got nothing but social justice on mine. <laughs> but it's HBO. And I pay very close attention to HBO and everything that they do. So for them to put a show out and me not know via social media when I'm on social media all day is pretty right. bonkers. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, probably worth checking out. Matthew Reese is great. HBO is typically great. So, you know, we got to look into it. Right on. Any more tidbits right. La- and such? Last tidbit. Last tidbit here. Are you ready to get into a time machine with me? Let's get into a time machine. We are going back to 2005. Okay, I like that year. Two titans of the industry are starring in a movie. Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Okay. The movie is called Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga. The film follows Icelandic singers Lars Eriksson, that's Will Ferrell, and Sigrid Eriks daughter, that's Rachel McAdams, as they are given the chance to represent their country at the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, okay. is this sounding up your alley, 2005, Ross? Because these two just came off of uh, Wedding Crashers, Success, uh, Rachel McAdams up on every every teen's wall after The Notebook, Hottest sure. Chick in the Game, Will Ferrell, Step Brothers, making you crack your ass off, you know? Every... Like, every... Just, like, Every teen didn't have a notebook poster on their wall. <laughs> but we love you did tell me you didn't love Rachel McAdams in college. No, I did. I, w- I would have I yes, yes, I loved her. That was like she was like the dream girl, right? She was for sure one of them, yes. Like approachable but hot but beautiful, but like the whole she had she had the total package. Sure. Yeah. Well, it turns out that this is not in 2005. This movie comes out in like two days on Netflix. And what the hell? How is stuff like this? What is going on? What is what is happening? How are Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams starring in a movie and it's just casually dropping on Netflix in three days? You know what? It has to be <laughs> it has to be a combination of the chaos of this year and like really also that's again, Netflix sort of will do this where it's like they, yeah, you Netflix don't know it's out. To- That's really what I'm saying here is that ne- Netflix is insane. They are just hurling money around, just hand over fist, just throwing millions of dollars around like it is uh, pennies into a well. And they're, they're so much so that when they, they've got now, again, I, I made the joke because both of these actors are a little past their popularity prime. Fair enough. You know, but they're I mean, still it's been a while since they're either still, one of them they're had... still they're still superstars in their own right. You know, this is Regina George and Ricky Bobby that we're talking about here. So, but honestly, this is just from looking at some of the images here of the the promotion, and I'm not going to watch the trailer yet. But first of all, I want to repeat the name again: Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga. Yeah, now Eurovision Song Contest is something that actually exists. It's like a Scandinavian American Idol or something. Okay, yeah, it's based on Eurovision Eurovision Song Contest by Eurovision European Broadcasting Union. Excuse me. So um, it, it's it's got a, I don't know. It's giving me Blades of Glory vibes. A little bit, yeah, but it looks like it'll it's it looks like it will be funnier as a result of them being older. Is what I mean. Met, yeah. Not mm-hmm. not being 2005 Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams because this looks absolutely bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
what in the yeah, hell so, is he wearing? I, I mean, like, it's just it. This is the age of content that we're living in, though. Is basically the the point of this tidbit is that like this is. 15 years ago, this would have been a massive follow-up to something like Wedding Crashers. Sure. To old school. Like, right? This would have been on the top of all of our, you know, can't wait to see it this summer lists. We're going to the theater, you know, and now it's just like, now it's just like- Drop in two days. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like a throwaway from Netflix. Like, oh, here's a movie you can watch. Who cares? Don't care. Watch it or don't. We don't care. Well, and that's the part of Hollywood that will never come back and we that we lost that's dead and that's sort of like the Quentin Tarantino dream that was murdered. Like, you know, that's that's part of it. You don't have that feeling anymore and it's not the same. And there are so many more movies. There are so many more platforms. There is such a lack of having to go. You don't have to go to the theater anymore. Now you don't even want to go to the theater. Maybe we never go back to the theater. You know what I mean? It's like, right. it's just a totally different ball game. And yep. yes, it was exciting. There's a, there's, it's a double-edged sword, right? We have more and more options than ever and more quality than ever. But there's so much of it that it's like you lose the hype and the focus and that sort of singular like, mm-hmm. oh man, we, we all can't wait to see the new Will Ferrell, Rachel McAdams comedy. Like that's not a thing anymore. Yeah. And then, yep. but you know, we'll see. You can always tell how good something is or how successful it is doing by uh, where Netflix puts it on their That's little right. home page. That's right. We'll see if it pops up like on our on top of our algorithm here in yeah. the next few days. All right. That's going to wrap it up for tidbits and such. Thank you, guys, everybody. Appreciate All right. It. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. Um, let's talk about Dave season one. Uh, uh, yes. I, like I said, I finished it right before we started recording legit minutes before we started. And I kind of just wanted to give my overall thoughts and get yours as well, because I know there were elements of this we didn't get to discuss as a result of my not having finished it. Um, and obviously the back half of the season did get a little more serious. There was less uh, sex dolls falling out of showers and less of like, I mean, don't get me wrong. There was still some very disturbing, hilarious and sick moments. Totally. But I'm just I'm looking at the episode list here and you got now you had watched Hype Man already. But from five on, we get Hype Man, which deals with mental health and and bipolar gator and we get talent shows which disorder, deals yeah. with like the you know the glamorization of your childhood and like did your friends actually like you yeah basically? the elements of childhood that are kind of weird that is like that right yeah, especially as a funny guy as a class clown guy it's like were people laughing at you or with you sort of thing yeah they're unfolding all that um what would you wear was that one was kind of a break that was a great episode but you still have the uh, what is it? Is it the relation? Is that is that that's where uh, L's and um, Allie's friend hook up? I think I'm pretty sure. Maybe e- maybe can't remember. Uh, and then uh, and oh then yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. What would you wear? What would you wear? Is where someone breaks into Emma's car and L right. tries yeah. to help her recover her laptop. Yeah. So you get the you get the you start getting their relationship stuff, and then um, eight and nine you you get the Dave and Allie relationship stuff, uh, which is pretty heavy at times. And then, and then in ten you get some you get little ticky trying to talk about the the prison the prison industrial complex out of in the nowhere, way that only he can. Out of nowhere, yeah, the <laughs> finale is called Jail, and it's just J- Dave trying to put out this song called Jail that's absolutely insane <laughs> and, like, 14 minutes long and delves into, like, basically if Dave went to prison, what the experience would be like, and then diving in all the racial elements and, like... Yes, it's really, it's just, I mean... At one point, he's g- got a list up so in the insane. cafeteria, and he's given people time slots for blowjobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's chaos, but yes, he, it, it, the, the final episode focuses almost entirely on the racial elements of a yep. white rapper in a black art, basically in hip hop. Yes, yes, yes. And he goes on the breakfast club and he has this discussion with Charlemagne, the God and, and the, in the squad. And essentially I don't like. I didn't really know what the takeaway was from the finale. I mean, because look, I get that he has to he has to address that, and that's a thing that you have to face as a white guy who is in hip hop. But it was just sort of strange. Like I never felt like Little Dicky was. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. I'm white. 
My what I thought about what he do, does or doesn't do it, it wasn't about me. The final episode was most, more for his black fans almost. I think to show people like, look, I well, have a you respect saying, you, for the. You, you never got the. You, you never got the feeling that Lil Dicky was like encroaching culturally on appropriating appropriation. No, I never got the feeling that he was doing anything that was that was uh, that w- that could even be perceived that way. So it seemed a little strange to me that he was addressing it. But that's also because it's probably never occurred to me because I'm fucking white. So, yeah, I, I both points are valid. Uh, it, it's not our opinion that matters on that topic. But I also didn't. I, I was surprised. I was a little surprised to kind of have that be a topic because. It seemed um, like we had already sort of defeated that conversation over the course of the season, like. Right. Uh, At that but, point, but we yeah, know I him mean, well enough to know. The fact that they did talk about it and that they did include that 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 kind of finale, I think, speaks to the fact that it's something that Dave deals with quite a lot. It, it, maybe maybe more internally than externally. I bet that's something that he worries about all the time. Is like being a white dude in a predominantly black art. Like it, you know. It, no, is there it, is that, is that okay. Element. Yes, there and everything that he talks through in that you know, and and sort of the conversation with Charlemagne before he then ends up spitting and like, dude, the way they ended the season where he's like, "What's your name?" and it just and he looks at the camera and it goes to the Dave screen. Uh-huh. That was fucking cold. There were so many moments in this season, dude. Even the part like, I'm just gonna dive into why I love this show as a whole. Yeah, it's one yeah, of my dive in. This, this is one of my favorite things I've ever watched. Um, I thought. It couldn't have been more made for me, obviously, as a white guy who loves hip hop and and loves comedy and thinks Lil Dicky is hilarious. And I've been a fan for years uh, and I didn't really know he had this side to him and all this depth to him. And, and I think he really I understand what he was trying to accomplish with this with this season outside of entertaining people. Obviously, he wanted to show that he has more to him than what you're getting in his in his music, which is. More important for him than it is for most musicians because he's a white guy in a black art. So it but I and he's not, he's also at the same time, he's also not Machine Gun Kelly or Eminem. Like he's not doing a traditional version of it either. Correct. And I thought so that, that was whole, cool how he kept addressing where he is, that. where he where he is a real rapper, but he is not talk he's not doing like regular rapper topics is really puts him in this Look, it put him in a weird enough spot where his best outlet was a new show on FX instead of a new album. Like that, like that's that's saying something in and of itself. I think that's fair. It's a very complicated thing. I don't know what what it is because, like, okay, and I think that's what makes it that's what makes it tough for him because his music is so comedy driven, and because he so often is asked, like, "Oh, so you're not a rapper? You're like a parody of a rapper, or whatever." Like all of that. I get as a content creator, as a musician, as an artist, as a whatever, that's something that you can have a really hard time wrapping your head around. And I thought he did a great job of addressing that throughout the season. But more importantly, he brought in so many different elements of life and relationships and interracial relationships. And I mean, you brought up the episode um, where the car gets broken into. What do you wear? What would you wear, rather? The one where the... the, the (laughs) Trippy's nephew buys a wooden shirt. (laughs) That tackles the element of like, you know, friends that become sexual. And then like what the sort of awkwardness of that. And like that it even gets into the the sort of a non-traditional male-female roles sort of situation where like Mm. Emma, Emma's more casual and chill about it, and Els is like super emotional. And like, you know what I mean? The roles are flipped from what you traditionally right. would see. It plays with so many different things. It gets into family, um, like that disconnect between our parents' generation and the hip hop generation and how they don't actually get it. But it's like, you know what I mean? His, Dave's parents are there for him, but they like, they don't fucking get it. Uh, getting into all the stuff with Gata and bipolar and like, and, and anxiety and Dave's weird body image issues with his fucking penis and it was just crazy and then they had incredible yeah, yeah. cameos throughout like yes. fucking Bieber shows up and has great Bieber. lines <laughs> yeah and like and like we said up top Benny Blanco couldn't have been funnier I, I was okay so 
when he came out, I was like, he was a scene stealer. He was. A scene I was stealer. like, that's not Benny Blanco. That has to be a dude they've <laughs> cast to play Benny Blanco because it's funny to think that Benny Blanco would look like that. And then when you look, I looked it up obviously immediately, and I was like, oh my god, yep. that's actual Benny Blanco. And then he's doing like an exaggerated, funny ass version of him, and like making fun of himself while also bragging about having like twenty Billboard number ones or whatever. Like, that was just masterfully executed on every level. And it goes back to the thing that I brought up whenever we discussed it a couple weeks ago or last week, whenever that was. Man, everybody involved in this show had such a good understanding of what they were trying to accomplish and was Mm -hmm. so on the same page. And they must have been so comfortable on set and must have been doing multiple takes to really hit this shit right because... It, I mean, <laughs> when I say doing multiple takes, I obviously understand that most sh- shows take multiple takes. I'm saying with a lot of this, um, what comes off as improv and such, that they had to have been doing, like, all right, roll with that, like, go with that a little bit more. Right. It was just so well done. It made me laugh. It, what was the, you've had such a full day with everything you experienced so far in your sandwich that you spoke to at the top <laughs> of the episode. And there's that great quote that's always like, you know, a full day is when you, what is it, you laugh, you cry. And something else. You're exhausted or some shit. I don't fucking remember. It's that great quote from the ESPYs, I believe it is. Um, From that dude who's no longer with us. Or woman. I can't remember. I'm totally screwing someone's legacy out of a quote right now. But that's what little... That's what season one of Dave did for me. It The emotional range this show had. And how it could be smart and deep and emotional. But then also be incredibly immature and disgusting and hilarious. That is very difficult to achieve, and it only comes with a layer of transparency and uh, genuine, like, you know what I mean? He gave us yeah, not him. Yet. That's the only way to achieve that is to give yourself to your art or whatever, and he he did that in this season, man. He fucking killed it. Like, I couldn't have been more impressed with how good this show was. I couldn't have yeah, been. Yeah, it, it, it falls in line with this new breed of half hour shows that we've talked about which are simultaneously like very funny and but also very dark and very real like atlanta like barry like louis like 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 fleabag yes exactly i I think what this one did was it it stretched it even further right like some of the stuff that was so obscure and so silly and so funny and then, uh, you know, and then really went for it on some of the darker stuff, too. Um, I, I thought one of the most impactful scenes of the season for me was uh, when his younger self shows up pre-show and he uh, smothers him in the in like the spaghetti. Like that. That shit was dark, man. Yeah, but it was. And I love this. It, it, it said so it, like it just. I don't know. It was it, that I liked that. I liked that scene a lot because it was just kind of, you know, you, your jaw is kind of on the floor, but you get it too. And it, and you, you kind of, you feel that you feel, you can feel with that visual that little Dicky that Dave is like overcoming something there. Yeah. That's, um, that's sort of the way I've always looked at. Like when you look back at your old self and these versions of yourself, you have two options. You can either like make friends with them, make peace with them, and forgive them, or you have to kill them. And Dave, uh, he chose the second. And it was tight, dude. Just the way, like, yeah, that you said that the show wasn't scared to go there. That was one of those moments where, like, bro, that 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 could not have been easy to make that fit and to make that hit. And mm-hmm. and it to, to pitch that and have it get accepted and like that was so cool as a creative person and somebody who I know I, we, you and I have both seen enough of Hollywood to know how difficult it is to get your ideas across. And in the music industry, it's, yeah. it's a very similar type of fight, a fight. And he addressed so repetitively in this season how important it was to him to remain true to his vision, to, to not compromise himself for money or for fame or for acceptance of the record label or change his art for other people. And it was just cool as shit to see that he stuck... That message was not only communicated directly, but then off uh, indirectly, he did things in the show that was was proof in the pudding. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's see. Oh, I've got the I've got the Jimmy V quote here for you. It, Thank if God. You laugh. If you laugh, you think, and you cry, that's a full day. That's a heck of a day. You do that seven days a week. 
you're going to have something special. Boom. Every episode of this show, almost every episode made me do all, th- all not all the episodes made me cry, but a couple of them did. You know one of the moments that got me, dude? When he's sitting in his computer and he's fucking with the auto-tune and jacking around before they go to do whatever with their family and mm-hmm. she's like, you need to go with me. And then like they, he like makes it into a tight little song right there for whatever reason. It was the yeah. beat on that fucked me up. That one made me cry. I was like, oh, good. Let's start the episode this way, Dave, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, yeah, dude, it just had so many moments. Oh, I would, I'm serious. It was like a 10 out of 10 for me. It could not have been better. It, it, uh, it, I, thoroughly impressed. <clears throat> I've got some questions here for you um, before we wrap up Dave talk. Sure, sure. My my first one is, did you, th- did you know going, di- did you, we, we have an idea of Lil Dicky going into this show, right? We kind of think we know who he is. We get a lot of personality from him from his music videos um and some of his more recent uh r- rap stuff too has di- has delved into that whole like I am a real rapper. I talk about funny stuff but I am a real rapper. So we've got we've got that kind of picture of kind of what we think of Lil Dicky, right? Right. Did did you think that Lil Dicky was this weird? Um I had a pretty good feeling, yeah. I there, there were I, I was kind of it took me probably up until around hype man to kind of come around on the fact that and, and I don't know and obviously this is a this is a you know it's Larry David and Curb right that's a version of Larry David this is a version of Dave Bird but like he is so kind of kooky and insecure and 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 hung up on certain stuff and like you know, like that that took me a while to kind of wrap my head around because I, I had a slightly different vis- version of him in my head. One that was maybe like a little bit more confident and a little bit, you know, more kind of um kind of in t- in touch with who he was a little in a way. Sure. And I think what you get on this show is the version of uh, this is past he's telling a story about him finding exactly i do think i do think that to do this show they've kind of rewound his career a little bit yeah he's he's certainly uh has at this point i'm sure would come off as much more confident this is about sort of his come up and what that was like obviously and i think he really exposes a lot of what so many creative people deal with in terms of inner demons and he just puts them out there and makes them more exposed and sort of sort of uh exponentially you know that's what i meant when i say he gave us like his truth uh i think he took stuff that a lot of people feel and really piped it up like his insecurity i don't think he was probably ever quite as insecure as he displays here but that's probably what it felt like right i mean he he really might have been because that's such a big piece of the show whether it's from like like we talked like we talked about with his childhood memories but i mean outwardly i don't think he probably ever came off like that it's more about how he felt internally right right and then displaying that version on the screen rather than the reality yeah yeah so it but for sure i I, listen i only knew he was weird because you have to be weird to be as good as he is at what he does and as funny as at at rap you can't be a normal person or what i would call normal and be like that also like we probably have a lot in common, me and this dude. Um, fortunately, my dick is relatively normal by comparison, I think. <laughs> but at least I hope. But uh, but in terms of his upbringing, and in terms of his love for rap, and in terms of his uh, sort of outlook, in some ways, not others. Um, man, I know I just identified with him a lot, obviously, and and it sucks. It sucks ass being white and not really having an understanding for. For especially for something that you love so much, um, and that has brought you so much joy, and music that's gotten you through so many things, and to like, for him to delve into all these different elements, it was just, it was just cool as fuck. It was a just very well masterfully done. He asked all the right questions, addressed all the right things. He can kind of take it wherever he wants from there. And I, the only thing, so, my one complaint is that I we didn't get to see that concert before Meek Mill. Yeah, I, yes, totally. And I so that I I've got. My final two questions are related to two things that you've briefly touched on here. So I'll, I'll start with one that's a little bit more narcissistic and probably a little bit more uh, us potentially projecting and having small pity parties for ourselves in a way. But I'm going to go there anyway, because you talked about relating to, to Dave in some ways. Sure, sure. Um, in Ali's Toast, 
episode nine, where his relationship with Allie kind of falls apart. I just, I, I could not help but think, and again, you and I are, are in a field that requires some of the same things that, that, that little Dicky that Dave's field requires, whether that's engagement with fans or being on social media or, you know, being on our phones, working, working with stuff that is like, quote unquote, not, you know, it's not important. It's, it's entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. I've had the conversations but, they had in that episode about a hundred times. Yes. So I, I, it just stood out to me because, and I know, I know that people get annoyed with spouses and significant others, regardless of the work that brings, that, that pulls them away from a relationship. But I think specifically when you, when you are in an industry that is entertainment related or adjacent or specific, and you're not a doctor or a lawyer or a banker or in finance, like you get a pass for that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. The, for, when you have a like, non oh, well, I'm on my phone because I have to be because my my boss is calling me and we've got a deal to put together and like what I have to do this and I feel like that gets so much. That's you don't have to do the that's, social media. That's so much more understandable to people than like no, I, I have to post something on Instagram. Do you know how do you? <laughs> Again, this I know what this sounds like. I know this sounds like we're just like. You know, stop saying we and us. Uh, it's just you. How long does it take you to post an in, to 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 do a post on Instagram for one of your for one of your brands, whether it's your personal WR Bolin or Ross Bolin podcast or OCC or whatever else? If I'm going just drive from scratch, which means I have to find a post, come up with the caption, all that shit. Yes, I don't know, man. Somewhere between ten and thirty minutes. Okay, all right. I mean, it's like I, I have spent an hour easy on coming up with a social media post. Yeah. Um, no, I would never do like, that. Like it's no, no, but <laughs> but the, the it doesn't matter. You and I have different skill sets. This is not. I've done social media like almost ninety percent of my career for a decade now. So it's like coming up with a social media post for me is sort of like drinking water. It's not something that I've struggled with. It's something I've literally done my whole career, every single yeah. day it, on fifteen it, different it, fucking platforms. You, and as you've gone on, maybe you've gotten more used to the fact that like not every social media, like like that not every social media post needs to be a home run. Oh, absolutely. Or even a, yeah, yeah. Or even a double. Right. No, um, we, you and I, you and I have very, very, varied ex levels of experience with social media. Yeah, totally. But but I still just got this whole like that that whole episode felt very relatable to me, and I'm sure to you as well. Yes. Because I don't think that we are given the same, and that people in our industry. Any creative field. That's the that's the thing you're missing. It's are, all non-traditional. Are, are jobs. given the same like leeway when it comes to dealing with work. So if basically. you have a non, like, those are obligations. Same as you needing to be, you know, looking at an Excel spreadsheet. If you have a non-traditional job, particularly in the creative field, particularly if it involves marketing or social media in 2020 then you have dealt with this issue um, because your significant other is like, get off your phone or what are you doing? And yes, it's it's much different me looking on my phone and doing a tweet and then an Instagram and a Facebook. Like the perception is that you are not engaged or present or whatever. And, it's, and that's the same argument that Dave and Ali sort of have, but it's a weird give and take, man. Anything in an, any non-traditional job i think you come across the problem you're speaking to but particularly in the creative industry and for musicians and for artists i think uh i think this is the, one of the more difficult elements of getting into that field is finding ways to make sure that your significant other understands your work in which yep. like dude like I, I mean you know as a recently divorced person i can speak to this with a a lot of frankness if i choose to so I'm going to pick my words carefully here, but <laughs> it's um, it's important that you that you that you surround yourself with people who understand your passion, but that you also give your consideration to. So, in the case of like what I found myself feeling was identifying with all of Ali's complaints, but also with all of Dave's counterpoints, which was very combative inside of my brain. 
And then when he started giving right. his reasoning, like, look, this is me. This is my art. Like, if you're not with it, then, like, I don't get it. Like, what what do you want me to do? This is my dream. How do I pause my dream? Because I felt that for several years um, when I was doing my old job and then g- getting into launching this company. And, and literally, this is my full 24-7, 365. This is my life. This is this is what I do every single day. And it's uh, when that sort of became an element Man, it's very difficult to balance all that and to get yeah to make your person understand that just because you have something incredibly important and big does not mean and from on your professional side of your life does not make them less important. That was always the thing that I felt was difficult to communicate. Like this is important to me in part because you're important to me and success is important to me and this opportunity is rare. And that's the thing I found myself with with Dave. I'm like. You know, no, like Ali, come on, like no disrespect. Like I understand, yes, he's being a little bitch, and and obviously Dave, the ver- everything he was doing in this episode, there were versions. It was a lot of selfishness, a lot of narcissistic behavior. He b- became uh, more and more unglued, sort of, as the season progressed in terms of his relationship. <laughs> but I did find myself ide- identifying with the argument. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, it's it's like it's sort of a. I always go back to the Jay Z so- song line, like either love me or leave me alone, like. Dick, Dave never gave anybody the impression he was trying to be anything other than what he was. So well, if you're and, sticking and, yeah, around him, it's right. like you and either I, like and, it or you don't. And I, and I know that it says a lot about me that I was identifying a lot with Dave, but the, I, I was envious of of how committed he was. Like yeah, yeah, how yeah. dedicated to being himself and expressing himself through his own art in the way that he wanted to, I, how important that was to him. This pussy, was this that, pussy that, didn't even get that, a divorce. That shit gave me last dance vibes, right? What about like, me? If you want something bad if you want something bad enough, you you are going to sacrifice a ton to get there. And that's that's just that's that's all there is to it. Like like it it doesn't that it doesn't shake out like that for everybody in in such a negative way, I guess. Right. Right? But like if you are completely committed to being an athlete or an artist or uh, that I think this would apply to any field. If you were that dedicated to becoming something like it's going to take away from other aspects of your life. Absolutely. And that's, that's the thing that becomes problematic is that you have to have an understanding with the people around you that there's, that that's, that's, that's the way it is. That's the way you're going. And, um, there are varying degrees of that, and it's obviously very situational. But yeah, no, I, I would argue that the number one thing uh, to try to combat that with is communication. You just gotta. It's it's really difficult, but like you know, there's it's it's what Dave did so well in this season, man. Just brutal honesty will get you so far in life if if you if you have the balls to be brutally honest, it will pay off. Um, but yes, no, there was so much of that element to it as well that was just like, oh my god, I couldn't relate to this more fuck in some cases fuck in some cases like yes dude you know i had different reactions to it but yeah no it i i i do i don't i also don't mean to say that i didn't understand ali's side of things it it just you know it I, hit I home also yeah i had that i had that reaction of like you know it's just different um so my final question for you here we finally in episode 10 we get what i was calling uh his eight mile moment we finally get the moment where the beat drops and he goes all out and just spits and we got we got tastes of it like when he's in the studio with uh with yg and we get like we get like some visuals like at the concert a a couple of times but i had basically been waiting for 10 episodes to get the eminem eight mile moment do you did it live up to expectations? Do you wish we had gotten more of those moments? Uh, I, I wish we had gotten Where we get more. to see Lil Dicky do his thing. I didn't think the holding back of them like made his eight mile moment at the end pay off even more, especially because it was a bigger message than being about him. It was more mm-hmm. about race and hip hop and, and just in general, all the complicated nature of Lil Dicky's career. Yeah. Um, and for that reason, I would say, look, 
the final his eight mile moment hit more for me because of the way they capped it because Charlemagne asked him what's your name and the, because of the yep. way he asked him and because yep. of the way like that if you've ever watched Breakfast Club that's ex- that's how that dude talks and yep. and when he's impressed with somebody he changes his tone a little bit and he gave you the <laughs> actual version that he would have given you on the radio and then for him to just look straight into the camera. And then it fucking closed. Like the way that they played all that out. Yeah, it was. It was impactful. No, that it was tight. It all. It it, it did. It did all work out for me. Like I loved. I loved it. I love that scene. Yes. Um, but that being but said, it, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, I, I to some degree, I feel like I'm watching a show with like, yeah, I don't have a good analogy off the top of my head, but you know, I, if I'm gonna watch a show all about LeBron James, I want to see him dunk. Yes. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, and I mean... And so, like, I... So, so I... I uh, we've spent 30 minutes here talking about how much we loved the show and the ins and outs and of and the nuanced, like, like emotional and, and kind of social aspects of the whole thing. So don't get me wrong. I loved all of that. I want more of that. I just... I could have done with, like... You know, we got the YG studio scene. We got this one at the end. I could have done with one more in the middle. And I'll tell you where it should have like, been. It was, da- the, Meek, it was the, the Meek Mill concert. They should have they should have yeah. let us watch him do a song before that instead of doing like all right again, super impactful the way he runs out and it's like the 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 sound fades out and then it's just like you're just watching him and it's, you're just like that was another one that brought tears and to you my can tell eyes. Tell that he's getting crunk. Yeah, that was another one that brought tears to my eyes because you see. And that's yep. again, that's where you're getting real Lil Dicky, where he, you see him out there and he's that's he's confident, he's dominating from the get-go. You can tell he's crushing it. There's no fucking like limp dicking into the stage. He's out there and it's on. I wanted to see that music though. Like that was I feel you. First episode, we get that moment. Last episode, we get that moment. But I, yes, the show was about more than the music, but just one more moment. They could have yep. given it to us, and I think that was the spot. All in all, again, again, 10 out of 10 for me. It was great. I, I really, I, I loved, I liked the show a whole lot, and um, definitely, definitely, will probably find a spot on my year end list. And I'm, I'm stoked for, uh, for season two whenever they're able to make it, make it. I would argue that it deserves some type of uh, some Emmy nominations. I, I, I would argue that it deserves some love. If you, I would argue that if you're gonna give Fleabag as much love as you gave Fleabag, then you better give Dave some love. Because yeah. I thought it was. I bet it, I bet it does. I bet it does. I thought it was as good, man. I did. I really did. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Let's do some Outer Banks before we uh, before we head out. But first, this episode of OCC is brought to you by Felix Gray Glasses. I constantly have my face in a screen from morning to night. There is no cutting back. I'm on my cell phone. I've got three screens in front of me right now, three different computers to record this podcast. And too much screen time results in tired, dry eyes, headaches, blurry vision, trouble sleeping. I've worn contacts since I was like 14 years old. And uh, I've experienced all of these symptoms. At one point, I just stopped wearing glasses altogether. And it was it was a nightmare, but not since I found Felix Gray Blue Light Glasses. They launched in 2016 with a singular focus of offering the most effective computer glasses on the market with the high quality of brand name designer frames and quickly became the Internet's favorite blue light glasses. I'm wearing the Faraday's right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see them, youtube.com slash Boland Media. If you're not watching on YouTube and would like to be, um, I got the clear Faraday's. I've got a pair of them in black. I've also got some of the Nash frames that I've collected over the past couple years. I love them all. They're phenomenal. Unlike other brands who use cheap blue light coatings that are ineffective and can chip or scratch, Felix Gray uses a proprietary blue light technology embedded directly into the lens. They've got prescription, non-prescription readers. They got you covered with optical glasses for work, sleep glasses in the evening that are clinically proven to increase melatonin secretion when worn leading up to bedtime. Go with Felix Gray. They're the best. Don't buy glasses from a company whose sole focus isn't making glasses. That's silly. FelixGrayGlasses.com slash OCC. Get a pair of blue light glasses from the pros today. Shipping and returns totally free when you go to FelixGrayGlasses.com slash OCC. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash OCC. Now jumping into Outer Banks, Barrett, your final thoughts on season one. You finished it out. It can't be as deep as, as Dave was, was it? Um. No, oh, that's no, shocking to me. That's terribly <laughs> shocking to me. Um, Ross, this is going to be a spoiler spoiler version of of OBX. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's perfectly fine. I'm not concerned. Okay. Um, we we get uh, well for one, this show cliffhangs you on season one. Like Netflix anticipates this show going three seasons minimum for sure. Uh, which was a little bit surprising. Not that not that they set us up for a season two, but the fact that this story doesn't even resolve itself. 
like we get we basically get shelved essentially in the middle of this specific uh treasure hunt so this arc treasure hunt arc that we begin at the big front you know because i've only seen the first what two and a half episodes or whatever yeah that doesn't even conclude. It just keeps going no, into season two. It feels like it's all really and 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 when you're into episodes eight nine, it feels like it's really coming to a head as well. Like it you it it looks like everything is kind of going to get resolved. And I had this I had this idea that they would kind of wrap it up and then put the gang back together, but in a different you know things would be different now for season two. And you know they'd kind of they'd kind of have this treasure hunt as as the base of things, and maybe some other stuff would spiral out of that. Stranger Things but formula. Instead, they they. But instead, they really just like we are. We're still going to be tracking down the same gold in a, in in a way when we get to to season two. Um, so that's that's interesting. Uh, the 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 plot really really gets soapy here at the end, and is is um, well, you really just have to suspend some disbelief because our boy, our boy John B, he gets framed for a murder by the big bad. Okay. And other people saw it, but because he's a 16-year-old kid, he determines that the only thing to do here is to uh, get a boat and flee to Mexico. Well, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Because that's because that is abs- that's the only way out of these types of situations is to to just to just flee. Look, when you're uh, just a hot 16-year-old boy who looks like a 35-year-old <laughs> underwear model. You don't have any uh-huh. other options but to flee to Mexico when they come for you, Barrett. You just you got to get out. You got to get you out. You just got to get out. Uh, so so he picks up his sixteen year old girlfriend on this on this boat, and they go right into the eye of a, of a tropical storm to try to get to Mexico. Spoiler alert: it does not work out. The ship capsizes, and uh, they both have to get they they both end up on the top of this boat when the storm is over, holding on for dear life like they're Jack and Rose. And then, by by the grace of God, a big tanker ship rescues them. Holy shit! Yeah, and it's on to uh, it's on to the Bahamas from there, my friend. That's where the that's where episode ten leaves us. They're on they're going to go to the Bahamas to continue this uh, epic quest. That's tight. No show has ever been more set up <laughs> for like a hey, we have no idea where we're going with this. We had a hit come out of nowhere, and we're going to string it along for as long as we can. Than Outer Banks. So, yeah, I mean, look, and he, here's the thing. It it really got, like I said, it got very soapy. It got really crazy. There there are some choices made in this show that I wouldn't have personally made. <laughs> uh, our menacing drug dealer is like maybe five foot six and and like his your calves would dwarf his. That's fucked up. Like, yeah, the dude has never seen a squat squat rack in his entire life. <laughs> So it's not and it it's not our boy Fezco. It's not our boy Fezco, and he, it's just like the dude that uh, the the one that I've told you about, who's who's just Rafe, who's going on a cocaine bender and like getting into all sorts of shit. Uh-huh. That dude is like six foot three and yoked, but is routinely getting his ass beat by this tiny drug dealer. So it's just that's not how that works. Th- th- I, I I took issue with that specifically, um, but other than that. It's very fun. It's a great. Like, we talk about escapism. It, it that's it. It's definitely getting tossed into that bucket. It's like, you know, let's watch some, uh, you know, some young ki- some young people just ride around and get it out there and 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 search for gold and make mistakes in their their budding relationships. They're just riding around getting it. Fucking. They're riding around and getting it, man. I love gold. All right, look, I wanted to talk about Matthew McConaughey <laughs> today because uh, because yeah. I watched something this over this weekend it inspired a conversation I want to have, but I'm going to hold it for next week because we ended up having so much fun talking Dave and Outer Banks and such that we uh, and and everything before that as well um, that we ended up running out of time. So we will hold. Is it the YouTube? <laughs> ser- is it the YouTube thing that he appeared on? No, it is not. Um, it's okay. one. It's one of his old movies that I watched that I had oh, okay. that I hadn't seen in years and years uh, with my parents over the week. But anyway, we'll talk about it next week. That will do it for today's episode of OCC. Huge thanks to our sponsor uh, sponsors today, both Felix Gray and Lisa. Go to lisa.com dot com slash dragon. Go to felixgrayglasses.com dot com slash OCC. 
to support our sponsors who support us. And if you'd like to support us directly in exchange for either three or four ad-free additional and exclusive episodes of OCC each month, go to patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. Last week, Barrett and I watched The King of Staten Island. We uh, rated and reviewed it in a full, what, 55 minutes, something like that episode, um, discussing the film. And uh, if you would like our thoughts and to experience that with us, then go to patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles, and enjoy. Follow us on social media, Instagram at oysters, clams, cockles, Twitter at clams and cockles, facebook.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. My name is Ross Bolin, and you can follow me everywhere at WR Bolin at W-R-B-O-L-E-N and listen to my other show, the Ross Bolin Podcast, wherever you are listening to OCC. Mr. Dudley, where can we follow you and hear more of your voice? You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Barrett Dudley, and then check out the Club Cool podcast at Club Cool Pod on Instagram. You can find it wherever you're listening to OCC. We do a little style, a little pop culture, a little bit of everything in between as well. Woo. Check it out. Woo. Until our next helping. Adios, muchachos. Adios.